it's, it's really quite a privilege and an honor to receive this award. Um, and I would like to dedicate this award to all the trainees in my lab, uh, past and present and future, uh, because they really were the ones that took the chance on some of the crazy ideas that we had uh, that led to uh, my career. Um, I'd like to uh, start by introducing you to this method with this uh, slide. Now, uh, MicroAD is one of the modalities in cryo -EM. Why is it important to use cryo? Because there's less radiation damage, and that's true even for materials and small molecules. There's enough literature in there. Um, and these are the four modalities in cryo-EM. We, we heard a lot about many of these uh, during the meeting. Uh, and the reason I, I, I like to start with this slide is that uh, to illustrate that all these methods use the same electron microscopes, they use the same cameras, the only difference is the way in which you run the electron microscope. Here you have um, uh, the imaging modalities, the tomography and single particle reconstructions. Here you use the electron microscope in imaging mode and uh, you collect pictures at high magnification and based on the pictures you then reconstruct the structure. In these two methods here, which are electron crystallography of two-dimensional crystals and now uh, microcrystal electron diffraction, uh, these are crystal based. And that means that in addition to taking pictures, you can also operate the microscope in diffraction mode and collect diffraction data. Now, of course, electron diffraction has been used for almost 100 years. Some of the early papers that we've uh, encountered in the literature were electron diffraction of catalase crystals from 1937. Um, and so what I'm going to tell you today about is how we made electron diffraction a viable method for structure determination of proteins and later, by extension, uh, of small molecule drugs and a whole bunch of different uh, molecules. And so we're focusing on uh, microEG. Now I started in cryo-EM when it was very unpopular. Uh, back then, X-ray crystallography was uh, all the rage and I actually joined the laboratory of uh, Ted Baker in Auckland. Uh, who's a very well-respected crystallographer, and I was going to do extra crystallography. What I ended up doing is electron crystallography. And here you obtain your protein of interest. Of course, now you can express member proteins. Back then, we had to purify them. And since I was in New Zealand, I was purifying this protein from uh, sheep material. <laughs> uh, and I actually obtained a butcher license so that I could go to the killing <laughs> and, uh, and collect the material. So at the end of the purification, you have your beautiful peak on your size exclusion, and here, of course, the protein is in a detergent solution. Now, of course, you could set up crystal trays and screen for crystal, crystal growth. What I did instead was uh, to add lipids back. You dialyze the detergent out. Uh, through slow dialysis, you screen crystallization conditions during that time, and under certain conditions you form a two-dimensional crystal, uh, and it's called a two-dimensional crystal because you have packing in X and Y, uh, but there's no Z. It's just a membrane and your protein is forming a crystal in the membrane. Now, these crystals are too thin to interact with X-rays, but they're thick enough to interact with electrons, and this is the electron microscope that I was using uh, more than 20 years ago. Uh, in Kyoto, Japan. Um, and these uh, crystals look like these. Uh, what I want you to take away from this picture is that these are very small crystals. This is four microns long, two microns wide, but there were only 160 angstroms in thickness. Um, now, if you look carefully here, you would see that there are actually two layers on these crystals. You, you have to squint, but uh, <laughs> there are two layers. So strictly speaking, these are actually three-dimensional crystals, and that becomes important. Um, now these crystals diffracted electrons very well. Here is an example of diffraction data. Um, and the way that electron diffraction worked at the time is that you would collect one diffraction pattern per crystal, because the crystal would succumb to radiation damage. 
you would collect a thousand different diffraction patterns from a thousand different crystals. You would then have to index each one separately and combine the data to get a 3D data set. And you see that with 2D crystals, indexing is very trivial. It's quite easy to identify the two uh, um, vectors here, and therefore you could index. Of course, back then I was indexing everything by hand. You had to give a Miller index by hand, so processing took a long time. But at the end of it, uh, we ended up with an all atom map. This was the first time uh, where molecular replacement was used on electron diffraction data. We had to figure out how to do that and uh, wrote the electron scattering factor library to, for the refinement. And it was the first time that uh, holes were seen in aromatic rings in electron diffraction data and water molecules were seen on electron microscope. So th there is a lot of firsts for this uh, structure. And so here's the structure. This is the aquaporin zero mediated membrane junction. And again, these are the two layers I was showing you. If you're looking at from the side view, this is one tetramer, this is the other, and they're interacting in a head-to-head -head fashion. And this was at 1.9 angstrom resolution in the early 2000s. This is 2004, 2005. And this is about 10 years before the so-called resolution revolution in cryo uh, when we When we realized that this was uh, groundbreaking, the night that I collected the first uh, diffraction pattern uh, in Kyoto, uh, Tom and Ifan and I went to celebrate rather than collecting more data. <laughs> <laughs> this is my, my younger self, um, Tom Waltz and Ifan Cheng, who's probably here in the audience somewhere. But, <laughs> yes. Um, so this is uh, 20. Uh, more than 10 years before single particle EM caught up to these type of resolutions. Now, uh, remember that this protein is crystallized, ah, uh, presented in 2005. My first ACA meeting was in uh, Orlando, and this is when I presented this for the first time. Um, remember that this protein is crystallized within a membrane. And <clears throat> in this particular study, uh, we had lots of densities that, lit, that fit the lipids really well. And so for the first time, we actually also had a structure of a surrounding membrane. And this is still the first, um, and I believe the only structure of a, of a, of a eukaryotic membrane uh, surrounding and interacting with the protein. And there were some interesting things that we saw. Uh, for example, uh, so here is one bilayer, here is the opposing bilayer. The membrane is not straight like you have in textbooks. It's actually undulating. You have regions that are thick, and the lipids are split apart, and they're deformed. And then you have regions that are thin, and the lipids are more uh, straight and uh, look more like a textbook. And it turns out that these regions where the, pro where the uh, lipids are split apart and deformed coincided with where the protein was. And so that suggested to me that uh, there must be an intricate system of lipid-protein interactions and that proteins and lipids actually affect each other's structure and function. And this is something that I uh, became very interested in and decided to spend my career studying. Uh, when I started my group in Seattle, uh, I proposed to work on uh, various membrane proteins, ones that undergo big conformational changes, study them by electron crystallography so that I could see what the membrane is doing. That was my program. That's what I proposed. And uh, in Seattle, when we started working on several different transporters, we could get beautiful two-dimensional crystals that within hours of opening the dialysis buttons, they started stacking. And they started stacking coherently in three dimensions. Here's an example. You can see all these layers uh, of these crystals. Each layer is a two-dimensional crystal. But they stacked coherently, and in fact, they were making a three-dimensional crystal. One of the things that I forgot to tell you about with Aquaporin Zero is that when we, <coughs> when we tried to publish the work, uh, we had a big resistance from the scientific community because these were really three-dimensional crystals. There were two layers. And uh, reviewers uh, said it's impossible. You cannot get a structure from a three-dimensional crystal because of dynamical scattering. And so we changed the title of the manuscript to uh, The Structure of Aquaporin Zero from Double-Layered Two-Dimensional Crystals. And then <laughs> there was no problem for the <laughs> paper. Uh, Yoshi since then has used the same methods to solve the structure of another 
aquaporin from double layer to be crystals and publish it like that. And later on for a gap junction from triple layer to double layer crystals. So uh, there was certainly precedence. But here, there are more than three or four or five layers. You can no longer pretend that these are two-dimensional crystals. These are really three-dimensional crystals. I knew that they were diffracting really well, uh, but there was no good way of collecting the data and uh, in a way that made sense and would allow us to solve the structure. And this is uh, when I started writing grants to the NIH and asking for funding to figure out how to use three-dimensional crystals in electron diffraction for structure solution. And those grants were all triaged. And it was always because of dynamical scattering. Now, what is dynamical scattering? Imagine that you're an electron and you come into a crystal. Now, electrons can interact with matter really well. You come into a crystal and you get scattered, and now you try to reach the camera. But instead of reaching the camera, you get scattered a second or a third or a fourth time. Each time you get scattered, you lose some energy. At the end of it, when you get to the camera, the intensity that you deposit no longer represents the underlying structure factor in the model. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, simulations from Richard Henderson suggest that if your crystal is more than five nanometers uh, in thickness, meaning one layer of the membrane, the dynamical scattering would already be so severe that your intensities will become random. And this was known in our field in macromolecular crystallography and in material science for decades. And this is really what killed electron diffraction for the longest time, to the point that electron diffraction became an obsolete, obsolete method where in macromolecules with proteins, you just would not try to do this. And so all of our grounds came back to reaction. There was nothing that we could do. At around about this time, uh, I was hired by HHMI and was given the opportunity to move to the Geneva Research Campus where the funding would be protected from peer review. <laughs> <laughs> now, they thought I was going to work on channels and lipids, but instead we ended up working on uh, what became my greed. And so in a sense, uh, they took a chance on us and I took a chance on my career. I gave up my tenure at uh, Seattle and went to the Geneva Research Institute where we had to figure out how to make sense of this. Now, uh, I knew from, uh, from my mentors what has been done in electron diffraction and electron crystallography of proteins. I knew that for 40 or 50 years, people in our field have been diffracting from three-dimensional crystals of proteins, calcium ATPAs, catalase, Richard Henderson had a projection map of catalase, 3D crystals uh, 20 years earlier. Wachu has done a lot of work on 3D crystals, always collecting electron diffraction, never able to solve the structure. And so um, I had to think hard about what is it perhaps that is stopping them from sol solving a structure. I knew that they were amazing microscopists. I knew that they could get beautiful data, just like we could. But what is it that is stopping them uh, from determining a structure. And I already decided that dynamical scattering is not important because the crystals of aquaporin zero were 160 angstroms, not 50 angstroms like Richard Henderson was saying. And yet we saw the structure and the Friedel pair, the R Friedel, was around 14 or 15 percent, meaning there is no deleterious effect of dynamical scattering. So I knew that that was wrong. So what could it be that is talking about? One of the things that I started obsessing over is an indexing issue. And, and that really brings me back to my origins in extra crystallography and understanding how the differences are between electron diffraction and uh, extra crystallography. In the next two slides, I'll explain to you the indexing issue and how we bypassed it and how that then opened up the field uh, of micro -ED. Remember that when you have 3D crystals, you have to worry about three vectors for indexing. I told you that when you have 2D crystals, you only have to worry about two. Now you can't pretend that this is a 2D crystal. Now you have a 3D crystal, you have to worry about three vectors. You also know that for extra crystallography, 
finding the three vectors from a single diffraction pattern is quite trivial. Here's an example of an X-ray pattern, doesn't matter what it is. Um, wavelength of X-rays around one angstrom, rather large scattering angle, and that means that you can find all three vectors in a single diffraction pattern. And look at it carefully. H could be the distance between spots going this way. K could be the distance between lines going this way. And L could be the distance between lines going this way. And so you can find all three vectors in a single pattern. Of course, that's the basis for X-ray free electron lasers, where you collect one diffraction pattern per crystal. You have a million diffraction patterns. You can index each one of them and then combine the data and solve the structure. But what I realized is that with electrons, the situation is completely different. Here's an electron diffraction pattern from a 3D crystal, doesn't matter what it is. And uh, the wavelength of the electron at 200,000 volts, which is what we were using, is just a small fraction compared to X-ray. And the scattering angle is very, very small. That means that the evil sphere, which we're interested in, is essentially flat at the resolution that we're recording. And so instead of having these beautiful circles, now you end up with straight lines. And this data, even though it comes from a 3D crystal, actually looks like it's coming from a 2D crystal. Because what you're doing is you're taking a two-dimensional slice through three-dimensional space. And this type of data does not have sufficient information to allow you to find all three vectors if you only have one diffraction pattern. So we can look at it carefully. H could be the distance between spots going this way. K could be the distance between lines going this way. But it's not clear where L is. In fact, I don't even know if what I told you is H and K, L and K. There's no way of knowing because I don't know at what point in reciprocal space we slice. <clears throat> and this is what I thought was the problem in the field. People were using electron crystallography methods to record data from 3D crystals, meaning they were collecting a thousand different diffraction patterns from a thousand different crystals. They were then indexing each one to the best of their ability. They were assigning a Miller index, but ultimately they got the Miller index wrong because there's no way of knowing. When they then tried to combine the data together, they ended up with random intensities. Well, random intensities meant for them dynamical scattering. Well, not really. I think the problem is that they really didn't know how to combine the data. So what was the idea that we had? Um, from my experiences with Aquaporin Zero, I knew that the doses that we were using, the fluxes, were way too high. There was no reason to use so many electrons and burn the crystal after one shot. Uh, and electron detectors were becoming more sensitive, so we could actually lower the dose. And the idea was quite simple. Let's lower the dose to a point that we could collect two diffraction patterns from one crystal. One at zero degrees and one at 60 degrees. But then you would have two patterns from one crystal. And there is a mathematical relationship between the two. And that's what we set out to do. Um, and uh, I can tell you that after some experimentation and optimization of the microscope, which I will get to a bit later, uh, we can now collect more than 140, we can collect 140 degrees worth of data, which is the full rotation range on the microscope from a single crystal by using a very, very low dose. And so how does MicroED work now? You start with crystals that are a billionth the size of what you need for X-ray because electrons interact with matter really well. They're moving because they're at room temperature, but we're going to freeze them. And we're going to freeze them because that stops the movement. And it also uh, protects the crystals from radiation damage. You transfer the whole thing under cryogenic conditions to a cryo TEM. When you find a crystal that you're interested in, you start the beam in diffraction mode. Uh, and the stage is continuously rotating, which is a very important point of this method. Um, and you record the data in a fast, as a fast, in a fast camera as a movie. And because the stage is rotating during that exposure, each frame in that movie will contain a wedge in reciprocal space. At the end of the data collection, you have many, many frames, uh, all of them coming from a single crystal. And that means that you can actually index and figure out the symmetry without any prior knowledge of unit cell dimensions of symmetry. What we determined is that you need at least 20 degrees worth of phi to be able to do that. Uh, once you determine the correct index, you can extract the intensities. 
And of course, the intensity is what we're interested in because that will tell us something about the underlying structure of the molecule in the crystal. Because all this data came from a single crystal, we know exactly where we were in reciprocal space for each frame. We can then combine the data back in reciprocal space and complete reciprocal space. And because these are 3D crystals, uh, which normally orient differently on the grid, we can also combine data from multiple crystals and complete reciprocal space to 100%. And here's an example of an enzyme that I determined uh, in the lab uh, several years ago to around two Armstrong resolution. And so, uh, when we did this for the first time uh, from those uh, thin 3D crystals, I realized that this is really very different from electron crystallography and what was done in, uh, in the field of macromolecular structure determination. Because the samples are different, the 2D versus 3D, the way the sample is made is different, the data collection is different, the data analysis is completely different. Uh, and so we realized that this is a new field of inquiry. And we coined the term microED, which stands for microcrystal electron diffraction. Microcrystal refers to the fact that these are three-dimensional crystals. And electron diffraction is the experiment that we do. And I would argue that this is the most accurate description of the method. Why is it important? Because rebranding is a very powerful thing. <laughs> these days, if you send a grant to a funding agency and ask for money to work on three-dimensional electron diffraction of crystals, you will get triaged and you will not get funded. Even though you're doing continuous rotation microED, if you don't say it, you will not get funded. That's just the sad reality of the world. If you say microED, you probably will get funded. And so, um, you know, it, it's, these are very important things to understand how science works and the kind of biases that exist. Um, but in reality, this really enabled uh, the field to move forward. Now, we, uh, we established a method using lysozyme because lysozyme forms very nice crystals. These are the type of crystals that Bernd Nanaga uh, who's now a professor at uh, Arizona State University made. These crystals are way too big. You put them into the microscope, you see nothing through them. Uh, and so right from the start, we had the opposite problem from extracrystallographers. We had to make these crystals small. <laughs> and so here's a preparation that Brent made. And you see that these crystals are much smaller than these, the pictures at the scale. But of course, the extracrystallographers in the audience wouldn't be too impressed because you can take these to a synchrotron and get data out of them. What you need to realize is that we're collecting data from these tiny fragments uh, that are in the platform. Now, uh, it's easy to identify crystals that look like these in your crystal drops, and these are the corresponding EM micrographs, but about 30% of the crystal drops probably look like these. These are these granular aggregates. They might look a little bit milky. They might look a little bit sandy. Those very often contain nanocrystals in them that are ideal for microED. This crystal came out of here. You see sharp edges, and the crystal is thin enough that you can actually see through it. So this represents a, a significant opportunity for microED for solving structures that perhaps were unattainable before. Once you uh, have your sample, you prepare the, the cryo grid, and this is done exactly the same way as you would for other cryo modalities, except now we have a crystal uh, right here uh, in the hole. Now, and at that stage, you transfer the grid to the microscope and you have to tell it to rotate. Well, an electron microscope was not designed for rotation. It was designed for stability. The stage is not supposed to rotate. And so, um, right from the start, we ended up having to hack the electron microscope at Genelia. This is Dan Chi uh, working in, uh, at Genelia in early 2010, 11, 12 uh, on this method. And the first thing we have to do is hack the stage so that we could do continuous rotation. And we engaged in the engineering group at Genelia and built this controller, which you can see here, uh, which connects to the back of the microscope. And you can determine the direction of rotation and the speed. And so that allowed us to rotate the stage either left to right and control the speed so that we could then uh, synchronize it with the camera. That wasn't a trivial thing to do. Uh, the next thing we had to do is we had to put a timestamp on each frame so that we would know where the crystal was in real space. 
And uh, as much as I like Thermo Fisher, they would not help us with this. And uh, um, I ended up uh, engaging the computing group at Genelia, and we wrote a image recognition software that recognized the angles that were displayed on the monitor of the microscope, converted it to text, and embedded it into the images. And then Johann Hattner, who's in the background, then had to worry about how to convert those images to something that extra crystallography would understand. Um, and so it was quite a, a long road, but at the end of it, uh, all of this is now embedded in thermal Fisher microscopes um, and is available to anybody. So, so that's, that was quite nice. So once you find your crystal, you start the continuous rotation, and here's a crystal that's continuously rotating, and you see the reflection flickering on and off as they come into the diffracting condition. And of course, uh, this is analogous to the rotation method in extra crystallography. Why is that important? Because nobody wants to learn how to use a new piece of software. <laughs> so here, the electron diffraction data mimics an X-ray crystallography data. And X-ray programs have been developed for the last 40 years. They're very, very sophisticated, and we wanted to take advantage of that to enable the field and democratize it so that everybody could do electron diffraction. And that wasn't trivial. Whenever we loaded a microD data set to an X-ray program, for example, MOSFILM, it would crash with a big error saying 0.025 angstrom for wavelength is wrong. <laughs> and so um, we collaborated with Andrew Leslie at the MRC, and, and together MOSFILM became the first program to process microEV data. Uh, at this stage, pretty much any X-ray software can process microEV data. Uh, now, we can collect an entire data set by using only one electron per square inch from total dose. Now, what does that mean? Um, it's very, very low dose. If you're doing material science, for example, if you do precession on materials or anything like that, we heard uh, earlier in the, in the, in the talk, uh, in the uh, conference, you use something like 2,000 to 5,000 electrons per square inch from total dose uh, for those type of methods. If you were applying this to a protein, the protein would turn to coal in a second, and you will not get any kind of meaningful data. If you're doing single particle EM, you're probably using something like 20 electrons per square angstrom until you've been able to collect enough data for motion correction. And so <coughs> microED is a couple of order of magnitudes less, and that means that you can go to higher resolutions, and you can look at structures with uh, limited radiation damage. And so here's the structure of lysozyme. Uh, it's done by one electron per square inch from total dose to 1.5 inch from resolution. Lysozyme became the very first protein to be determined from three-dimensional crystals using electron diffraction. Uh, since then, I'm just showing you some examples from my lab. We've determined many standard proteins en route to um, optimizing the method further. Uh, there were materials that we did that, that were new and, and unattainable before. We showed that the method is appropriate for small molecules and uh, more recently brought back the method to member proteins, which was the original intent for my 3 d And this is just a survey of the PDB and the CSD for um, unique structures that have been determined, uh, not just by us, but by many people around the world. And you see that this is gaining uh, in popularity. Now, I want to spend the rest of the time uh, telling you about what we're the most excited about, and that is drug discovery to do with membrane proteins. Why membrane proteins? Because membrane proteins are your first line of defense for a cell. This is where stuff that comes in has to interact with to get internalized to a cell. Um, and when you want to do efficient drug discovery, there's two things you have to worry about. One is the structure of the drug, the other one is the structure of your receptor with the drug bound. And once you have those two, you can start doing things like precision drug docking and uh, discovery. Now, uh, for the longest time in macromolecular crystallography and EM, we were using materials to calibrate the electron microscope. I remember doing this as a student uh, in Auckland because they're very robust and they give you a, a diffraction pattern of known unit cells that you can 
used to calibrate the electron microscope without worrying about those. But in 2018, we published this method of how to do it, where you take a powder, you crush it between two glass slides, and, uh, um, and then deposit that onto the electron microscope, and you see here just increasing magnifications. You see these blotches. These are nanocrystals that actually exist in uh, a powder that looks amorphous. So by eye, it looks amorphous, but at the nanoscale, it contains nanocrystals. And these are ideal for micro ED. <coughs> and you see different shapes. These are polymorphs, which chemists are interested in. Uh, you can collect data from each one separately. So here is carbamazepine, which is a uh, sodium channel blocker, uh, two different packing. And this is the type of data that we would typically get. In green are the hydrogens that we did not model. And for small molecules, we typically end up to, with uh, better than one angstrom. And the whole thing takes about 30 minutes by using uh, micro ED methods. Now, uh, later in 2018, we published this paper where it showed that you can actually take mixtures, four different powders in this case, place them on the grid, uh, and you see all these black boxes now are not only different polymorphs, but also different uh, molecules. And you can collect data from each one separately and determine the structure. And uh, I'm not aware of any other structural biology method that can deliver atomic resolution structures directly from mixtures without having to go through a uh, crystallization or purification step. And so this is when uh, chemists really became very interested and a lot of material scientists started exploring uh, what we were doing and, and actually started using uh, micro ED methods, meaning continuously rotating the beam rather than doing uh, other things. And at this stage, there's uh, more than a thousand labs that are doing uh, micro ED in some shape or form uh, around the world. This was also around the time that uh, two high ranking officers from the US military showed up in my office uh, in, <laughs> at UCLA and started talking about national security. And uh, they were interested in identifying what people bring into our country. And I'm happy to tell you that probably in about 10 years' time, there will be a micro ED machine at every port of entry to the US. So that I encourage you next time you come to the US to bring some powder in your pocket. <laughs> <laughs> you and your trusted TSA officer could do some micro ED on the spot. <laughs> If they know what they're doing, then you will not end up in jail. <laughs> um, but you can take this further, and with automation that Johan Ange was in the audience, uh, you can actually take very complex mixtures of many different chemicals, put them on the grid, and automatically collect micro ED data and solve structures. And in his study, um, he can collect 1,500 data sets autonomously overnight using the microscope and in the morning when he comes in he has 1500 structures uh, of small molecules. Now when you have a volume like that you can start looking at analytics and you can start doing some things that are that have been reserved to mass spec before. So you can see the percent of uh, what's in your mixture for each molecule. You can identify what's in the, mo in the mixture and if you want it you can have structures. So this, as the technology progresses, this will become faster and faster and the volumes will become bigger and bigger to the point that I believe you would no longer need to rely on that spec. I think that you will be able to do uh, micro ED to identify what's in your uh, mixtures without any prior knowledge uh, of what's in there. Now, uh, that brings us to the second part of rapid discovery, and that is membrane protein. Member proteins is it's, it's everything that I've known ever since I was an undergraduate. They're very, very difficult proteins to work with because they're amphipatic. They have regions that are water-hating and they have regions that are water-loving. Somehow, you have to figure out how to express these guys, how to extract them from a membrane, crystallize them, and solve the structure, and all along keep them happy so that they don't uh, um, crash out of solution. To make things worse, we're interested in the membrane. And so when you have the protein in the membrane, it's dynamic, it's active, and that makes it a lot more difficult. There are several ways of studying protein. Member proteins, you can do this in detergent, of course there's no membrane there. You could do this in bicells where you have one or two layers of uh, 
uh, lipid, and the whole thing is capped by a detergent, and you can do this in the pedicubic phase, meaning you have vesicles of your protein in there, and you crystallize the protein vesicle in three dimensions, and there's a lot of solvent uh, channels, and the whole thing is, is very uh, viscous and difficult to handle. And so, of course, this is increasing the difficulty, and I want to focus on this method, because that's what we spent the last five years on uh, in my lab. And the majority of the work that I'll describe uh, was done by Mike Martinovitz, who's in the audience, and uh, um, Anna Sirieva, who's also here, and William Nicol, who's uh, not here. And so the lipidic cubic phase, as I mentioned, the protein is active, is dynamic, uh, and somehow you try to crystallize it. And if you're lucky, you get a crystal that's about this size. Um, and to make things worse, the consistency of the LCP is like toothpaste. And so now you have to figure out how to put this on the grid, how to make it thin enough so that you can get electrons through it, and still maintain the crystal viability so that you can get a structure out of there. And if you are lucky and you can figure out how to put this on the grid, typically this is what you would see. It's just a big goop, and there's really no way of knowing where the crystal is. And so what uh, Mike has worked on uh, for the last five years was how to find these crystals in the LCP. And what we started working on, uh, these are the fruits of the labor, uh, where there is, the protein is labeled by fluorescence. We place the LCP on the grid. We then use fluorescence microscopy to identify where the crystals are in the LCP. We can then correlate between light and EM and then come in with a focused ion beam and etch away all of the LCP from above and below so that we just expose this tiny window into a crystal so that we could collect my 3D data from it. I just summarized about five years of Mike's life. <laughs> um, here's an example. This is LCP on a grid, and you see nothing through it. You can focus on this area here, and you see that in uh, TEM, you of course see nothing through the LCP. But when you turn the fluorescence on, now you notice that there's a crystal buried right here. With uh, procedures that uh, William developed, we can determine fairly accurately where the X and Y is, kind of okay in Z, but we can correlate between light and EM, and we know that the crystal is right there, so that's where we have to go and melt. And so here's a real example. Here's a crystal before and after milling. You see that this is brighter because all of that was removed from above and below. This is what it looks like in SEM. And you see that we've left behind a sliver of this crystalline material, which is 200 nanometers in thickness. And we've removed hundreds of microns of LCP from above and below just to expose that tiny fragment. So it's about 200 nanometers. And from that, we could get beautiful diffraction data. And a single nanocrystal gave 85% completeness to two angstrom resolution. And so here's the structure of the human adenosine A2A receptor with antagonist bound. We could get a beautiful density for the antagonist and the antagonist binding pocket. We had several unique cholesterols. And to our delight, uh, an almost complete lipid bilayer uh, surrounding the protein. And so we're getting back to the original um, uh, um, target for this method, which is to visualize the membrane around the protein. Now, A2A was done by synchrotron radiation and x -Files, and this is the comparison here. The resolutions are comparable, but the sample requirement is much lower uh, for my 3 d and, and of course, that is important because that can enable projects that are not tractable by, by these methods here for biochemistry reasons. And so here's an example of a, of a live uh, uh, protein. This is the mammalian voltage-dependent anion channel VDAC. It's a functional mutant. The, the wild type has been done at nauseam by x-ray. But this is a functional mutant. And uh, um, Jeff Abramson from our department got crystals that look like these. These are in bicells. And he's tried to optimize these for almost 10 years. This is the best that he could get. Now, you can place those on grids. And this is what the grid looks like. And using similar methods to what I just described, you can tell that there's a crystal here. You can mill it, and then solve the structure. And uh, what was really nice to see is 
when we started looking at uh, crystal contacts, there were two types of interactions. There were protein-protein interactions, like here and here, and then there were these big gaps in between. And these gaps fit lipid really well, just like with acroporin zero. And uh, we're now in the stage of uh, collecting more data, pushing the resolution so that we could uh, identify how these lipids are around the protein. So we're finally at the stage where we can start looking at those membranes that I was interested in more than 20 years ago. And it required a whole new method uh, to get there, but I think we're finally there. Now, uh, of course, what you want to do is attain the unattainable. And uh, Anna Shireva, who's here and will give a talk later today, uh, did her PhD with uh, Nadine Charizov at USC, and her project was to look at uh, this particular protein that became very hard to work with. Anna made hundreds of constructs, tried thousands of crystallization assays for each of those constructs. At most, she got were crystals that looked like these are really tiny crystals, very sporadic. They would succumb to radiation damage very fast as synchrotrons, <coughs> and they were too sparse to do expels. And so the project was abandoned. Um, when Anna graduated, she joined my lab for microEV and wanted to do microEV on this and see if it would actually work. And so we put it through the same uh, procedure that I just described to you for A to A. We placed the LCP on the grid <coughs> and used fluorescence <coughs> to, to identify where the crystals are. And here are examples of the crystals. We would melt and leave behind a 200 nanometer thick lamella, which is a part of the crystal. And from that, uh, we were able to collect a uh, three angstrom diffraction data set and solve the structure of the human basic person B1 B receptor, which is a structure that was not possible uh, up until then, despite major effort uh, in extra crystallography. Um, and the structure was to, the final structure is 3.2 angstrom, P1 symmetry, so very, very difficult. And they had to merge data from 14 uh, uh, unique crystals to get there. Uh, so, so this was really a heroic effort, but uh, B1B is the first novel member protein structure done by MicroEV that was not attained before. And so I, I see that this is where MicroEV is going to have the biggest impact in the next 10 years, is determining structures of small member proteins that were beyond the reach of the technology of the Jonah. I want to end uh, just by telling you a little bit about some of the technological developments. Um, in the last year or so, we started experimenting with <coughs> direct electron detectors in counting mode and an energy filter. And now uh, we have to drop the dose to this ridiculously low level. And even for macromolecules, we can get to subatomic resolution uh, using this method. And uh, this is what the map looks like uh, when you go better than one angstrom for proteins. Uh, in blue are actual densities, and not just a representation from chimera. And so you can see all these uh, beautiful amino acids. The blue is the density, the black is the uh, protein. And uh, at these type of resolutions, we can identify nearly half of all the possible hydrogens in this protein at two sigma. If you drop the sigma a little bit lower, you can identify nearly all the hydrogens in this protein, which is, which is really cool, because that means you can start looking at things in a new way. <coughs> me. For example, hydrogens tend to be closer to nitrogens compared to oxygen. If you just refine a writing hydrogen, that's not where it goes. Uh, but here we can tell it's a little bit removed. Uh, we saw the same thing with alpha helices. I'm going to stop showing uh, density because it gets very messy. But we can see hydrogen between amino acids. And importantly, we can see the charge state of amino acids. Here's a fully protonated histidine. Why is that important? Many member proteins are regulated by a protonation or deprotonation of a histidine or an aspartic arginine pair. 
now we can actually look at this by microEP and understand the mechanism better. I'd like to stop there um, and uh, thank everybody who's worked with us. Uh, we collaborated with almost 100 groups around the world uh, to make this possible, and I can't list everybody. I've listed the people that contributed to what I showed you in this seminar. I specifically want to acknowledge the people in my lab that uh, really are, are very talented, uh, and they're working in uncharted territory, and they're trying their best, and, and I appreciate everything that they do. Uh, many of them have gone on to wonderful independent careers. Some of them are looking for jobs, so we can talk to them here. Uh, this was one of the lab pipes to the Hollywood sign, which they changed to the Hollywood sign. <laughs> <clears throat> and importantly, I'd like to acknowledge HHMI because remember, without um, unrestricted money, this would not have been possible. Uh, and I think that as a community, we need to think about, about that. We need to think about the implication of what is the kind of science that we're missing on because we have preconceived ideas of how things should work. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tamir, for an absolutely fascinating talk. I think I'll speak for everybody in the audience, and especially those of us who used microscopes before. You could do something like this, right? It's just amazing to see how science develops when somebody takes an idea and runs with it. We are open for questions. Uh, beautiful work. I'm wondering if the uh, bidding from the LCP crystals, is it uh, now automated? Because imagine you need to screen so many crystals. If, if this process takes a long time, it's difficult to apply this technique Broadly, that's my first question. And my second question is, um, so for the non-LCP crystal, the conventional, uh, can you comment on the sample preparation, how to convert the normal crystals, the normally big size, into the uh, nano crystals, or what's the most commonly used technique in your lab? Thank yeah. you. So I'll start with the second one. Um, typically for soluble protein crystals, they're a lot more robust. And so you can break them up by pancreatic, just by getting up and down the crystal solution, <coughs> or vortex, vortexing, that works fine. And then you just pipette the sample onto the grid, and typically that works well. Uh, the rest of it is the, is the same as uh, cryogen preparation. Um, the LCP, um, so fit milling can be automated. You can uh, tell the machine where to mill and how much and so on. Uh, I'm, I, I don't know that it's as useful at the moment for samples in LCP because we just don't have that many crystals in the LCP. I'm sure that in the future, if there is a sample where there's the crystal density would be higher, then these type of automated procedures will become very important. Uh, it's a beautiful talk, and this still reminds me that uh, the first time you told me about your idea of doing micro ED before you have come up with a name, my first reaction was that, uh, Tamir, you're wasting your time, you're never going to work. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm so glad that I was wrong and then you, you made it work. And uh, my question is that uh, I'm going to get to this supple and strong resolution. Do you see the difference of positive or negative charge to, uh, um, 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 residues or atoms. And I was always curious about this one because the electron is a charge uh, compared with X-ray. Thanks. Um, uh, negatively charged residues tend to have a weaker density. Um, but uh, I'm not sure that we looked carefully as to why uh, or systematically looked into it. 
Um, it's just from memory. Um, those of you that don't know, I learned DM from Ifan. And, um, and I used to um, go to Tom's lab as a student uh, and use the electron microscope. And Ifan is the one who taught me electron microscopy. We're talking about 25, almost 30 years ago. And Ifan is a physicist and I'm a biochemist. And uh, at night, after everybody would go away, I would teach him biochemistry and he would teach me physics and electron optics. And uh, it's funny that now, so many years later, I go to conferences and people talk about Ifan as a biochemist. <laughs> and they talk about me as a physicist. <laughs> and we always have these funny conversations over the bar. And, and at how it's funny how your, your history is just erased after a few years. Um, and I remember as my teacher when I went to his office at UCSF um, <coughs> and told him about, I said, this is what we want to do. My heart sank when my teacher says, you're wasting your time, you're going to destroy your career. <laughs> um, but I then said to him, but here are the results. This is what we did. And I had to explain to him why uh, it worked. And, um, and, and, I, and I always remember that, uh, that encounter. Yeah, Thank hi. You. Hi, here. It's a great help. And my question is related to sample preparation and when we are freezing the crystals, do you use the cryo to protect cryo protectant or is it like uh, with these small doses is enough to pick the crystals as like in a well solution? And another question, when we are collecting the data in the micro ED, you are using the continuous rotation. Is it like how you cope up with the the what you call mosaicity? Do you find anything like that? And also, is it possible to collect, rotate the, the crystal in a 3A, 360 degree? Do we collect the data okay. in 360 uh, degrees? I'll, yeah. I'll try to remember your three questions. Uh, <laughs> you cannot do 360 degrees. You can do a maximum of 140 degrees on the stage. Uh, if your symmetry is high, you can get to 100%. If you have P1 symmetry, but the crystals are oriented differently on the grid, you can still get to 100%. If you have P1 symmetry and the crystals have preferred orientation on the grid, you're screwed. You're going to get to a maximum of 85%. And that's so far the case with uh, catalysts, for example. Now, what Cody Gilman, who's also here somewhere, uh, is a graduate student who's giving a talk later today. What he's done is he figured out how to crystallize proteins on grids without any support. That means that the crystals will not be able to get a, a preferred orientation. And so that's what his thesis is about. I really forgot what your other two questions were. <laughs> so what is, the, what is related to the mosaic CD when yeah. you are collecting the continuous layer? Yeah. So it's very difficult to tell if you have mosaic CD or not, um, just by the nature of the experiment. If it is, um, if it is, uh, uh, very big or very pronounced, we might be able to tell. But you know, there are some cases where we collect beautiful data and it just doesn't process. And we don't know why. Um, and there are some cases where we collect data that to us by eye looks the same and it processes very well. Uh, so it, it could be something like that, it's just that we don't know. Remember, we're using x ray software that was designed for x rays and it still makes assumptions about how the data was collected. And so even though it works, it's, it's not ideal. There's still a lot to do. What was your first question? <laughs> first question is when we are freezing like oh, yeah. crystals. Uh, uh, um, cryo. Cryoprotection. We normally don't add the cryoprotection because this is all vitrified ice. Uh, in some cases for protein crystals, they already crystallize in a, in a cryoprotectant solution. And that's sufficient. I do remember one project, although I'm blanking on what it was, where we did have to experiment with product protection, and it did help. So it, it really, you know, just like an extra crystallography, it, it, each protein is, is its own diva and it's going to require its own uh, uh, special handling. 
Uh, very fascinating talk. So, uh, with uh, micro ED being able to do a lot of things, what X ray crystallography used to do. So, what do you think would be uh, the future of X ray with micro ED being so advanced? Micro ED will never take over from X ray crystallography. It's not, uh, you know, uh, as scientists, we tend to like to think in absolute terms, and that's not, it doesn't work this way. Um, there's room for everybody. Uh, there are projects that even in my own lab, uh, if your crystals grow to a size that allow you to do x-ray and you can get x-ray, then you do x-ray. I mean, uh, May May, uh, my graduate student presented an x-ray structure uh, at this meeting. Um, if you're unlucky and your crystals don't grow uh, much, then you know, maybe microED will be a, a, an opportunity. If your protein is large enough and you can do single particle, why, why bother with crystals? So, you know, I think that as a structural biologist, um, you need to be able to adapt to the biological question and use the method that is best to answer the questions that you have. And so if you look at what we've done in my lab, we've done single particle, we've done tomography, we've done uh, even we have one paper with NMR. Uh, you know, it depends what you're trying to do. So um, I think there's room for everybody, and 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 all these methods have unique aspects to them, and unique uh, advantages and unique disadvantages. Uh, well, thank you for your talk. First of all, uh, I wanted to follow up on the question that you're teacher just asked, uh, and maybe you touched on this before, but um, he was asking about you know, the differences between negatively and positively charged residues. Um, in relation to that, what is the principle of the um, scattering power of the electron? For example, in x-rays, I know the scattering factor of the x-ray is directly proportional to the number of electrons. In neutron scattering, it's a very unpredictable function you just have to know empirically. Uh, is there a rule for electrons similar to X-rays? Does it vary with some particular characteristic? Yeah, so you can certainly look at scattering factor plots uh, that have been published before. Um, uh, electrons get scattered, so X-rays get scattered by the electron cloud. And that's actually important because then if you want to do phasing, let's say with a tungsten atom, you have a lot of phasing power. But now electrons don't get scattered by the electron cloud. They get scattered by the nucleus and the charge. And a tungsten might look like a carbon. Uh, and that means that the kinds of phasing um, uh, methods that exist for X-ray, like um, uh, anomalous scattering and so on, that doesn't exist for us. Um, the scattering at, Mike will be able to correct me if I'm wrong, uh, the scattering at low, at high resolution I think is the same, but at low resolution differs between X-ray and uh, electron diffraction. Correct? Okay, he waves his hand. Um, <laughs> Uh, you know, um, the electron scattering libraries that exist uh, assume that scattering happens from one atom at a time. But of course, the charge is, is a local charge. So if you have a carbon that is attached to an oxygen or a carbon that is attached to a chloride, um, the scattering from that is going to be different. And the scattering libraries today do not account for that. Uh, and it's a very complex thing to do, and I think somebody should do it. It's way beyond what, what I'm able to think about. I think it's what Mike wants to do in his lab uh, uh, at UCLA. But um, uh, it's a very complex thing to do because, okay, you have a carbon with an oxygen, but now this carbon also has two hydrogens. But the next one over, it only has one hydrogen. So that scattering is all different. Uh, and I think that once this is figured out, 
there would be a lot more that could be done with MacRaeD compared to what is done today. I, I don't know if I answered your question. You did. Yeah. <laughs>